Hi guys, I know we already had notes that we kind of started in some classes and didn't start in other classes over firearms and ballistics, but in light of me not being there, I thought it would be easier and quicker for everyone if we just kind of did it in this format. So what I've done is I've reduced on some of the notes. I know that the packet's still fairly thick, but I feel it's like it's more organized now. So we're just going to go through it and hopefully we will come out okay on the end. So here we go. Quick disclaimer, yes I understand that there are sections where like words are printed on top of each other or pictures are moved. That happens sometimes when these get printed. We'll just have to deal as best we can. There's plenty of space for you to rewrite over though. Alright, if you don't already have one, you probably will need a highlighter for this or at least a way to underline. Um, so go ahead and grab one of those. Someone can pause the video at this point and then just hit play when we're ready to go. Alright, so the whole purpose of, or reason for ballistics or firearms identification is to determine whether a bullet or cartridge was fired by a particular weapon, particular gun. So pretty much we're trying to match the bullet to the weapon that that bullet came from. So I'm going to highlight that because that's, you know, sort of important. You should probably highlight it as well. Okay, so this image just compares and shows some of the major parts of a handgun, but it's comparing a revolver, like we watched in the video, to a semi-automatic pistol. So one has that revolving chamber that contains the bullets right here. The other has that clip or that magazine that's detachable and has the bullets stacked one on top of each other that the internal mechanisms of the gun will pull out and send forth when you pull the trigger. Okay, I know this is a slide that has some issues. There are like words double copied on top of other words. So whatever you can't see, it would be my suggestion to write those down at the bottom part of that slide. I'm going to go ahead and highlight the things that I really need you to know off of this. So this slide and the one after it is going to compare the major differences between rifles, shotguns, and handguns. So starting with shotguns, we're looking specifically at their barrels because that's really where the majority of the differences are. For a shotgun, it tends to have a long barrel, so we're going to highlight that, whereas handguns tend to have a shorter barrel. And you'll see when we flip over that rifles ha also have a long barrel. The steel that's in a shotgun is normally fairly thin, and it's really smooth on the inside, and it allows the shot to glide and to move down the barrel without friction. So I want you to highlight that it's very smooth and on the inside, because that's the part that's important, it's very smooth on the inside, and that it allows your shot to move without friction. Okay. Now, it tends to be thinner, like the barrel of a shotgun tends to be thinner than the barrel of a rifle, and because of this extra thinness, it does not withstand as much pressure. So you put too much pressure on it, and it will bend or crumple and not work the way that it's designed to work. Your handgun, on the other hand, is designed to be shot while being held with either one hand or two hands, um, as opposed to resting it against, uh, you know, your sh the, sh blah, blah, the shoulder of your shooter, sorry. With shotguns, you tend to see that they will brace the gun against their shoulder a whole lot. Um, it has more of a grooved pattern on the inside of the barrel, so let's go ahead and highlight that. Okay, those inner bores, that diameter on the inside, they tend to have a groove pattern, so lands and grooves, kind of like we mentioned before. Okay, long guns, I mean, like the name suggests, they're long. That's a kind of a duh. They have a whole lot more thickness to their walls, and their grooves don't just go, they don't just run vertically down the barrel, they actually spiral or twist as the barrel, con as the barrel continues. Sorry. So they have thick walls and their groove spiral, and that pattern, that grooved pattern, is called rifling. All right, so what's the purpose of rifling? So again, rifling just refers to a spiral of grooves that's normally 
etched or pushed into the barrel of a gun, and it's done to promote spinning. So a bullet that spins is way more accurate than a bullet that moves just straight through the air. By cutting these grooves, you actually leave two sets of marks on the inside of a gun. You leave lands, which are high parts, and then you leave grooves, which are low parts. Okay, so in between each groove, you have a land. What the grooves do is they grab the bullet as it travels down the barrel, and that puts a spin on the bullet. So the grooves grab the bullet as it tra tra ugh, sorry guys, travels down the barrel, and that causes it to spin. The grooves tend to be twisted, and they can be twisted either clockwise or counterclockwise. So they're either spinning to the right or they're spinning to the left. It just depends on the preference of the manufacturer. All right, so just to make sure that everyone's clear on what a groove is versus a land, um, if you look at part A, part A is going to show your land. And the land is the raised part right here that I'm coloring in on your diagram. So that would be a land, and this right here would be a land. Anything that's pushed up is considered a land. Okay, so the parts that I just colored in in yellow, that would be your land sections. That's the part that's labeled A. Your grooves are the parts that are sunk down. So they're labeled B on this diagram. So this part here, pretty much anything I'm about to color in in blue, would be considered a groove. Whoops, sorry, iPad slipped. So here's another groove. Then on this picture, that would be this section here and this section here. Okay, so notice that you have grooves and lands in between each other. So like here, um, we're on that section close to A. Let me switch to my laser so I can show you. You have a land, groove, land, groove, land, groove, land, groove, all the way around. Okay, so they alternate. And again, this is what your rifling or your spiraling comes from. And if you look at it on a bullet, this is what you would see. Right here, this would be a groove. This would be another groove. This here would be a land. Now this is really hard to show in 2D because this bullet is drawn flat, but when you look at it in real life, it's, it's fairly easy to tell the difference between the two. Right here's another image just showing you, you know with color this time, what the lands and the grooves look like and then what that spiraling effect looks like. And here's an example of that shotgun barrel that I was talking about. You can tell that the inside is smooth. They're like stripes coming down, but they're all vertical. Nothing's cut into the actual barrel. Okay, this image just shows you that riflings can look different just depending on how it's cut, like what tool is used to create it. By the way, this right here, that's the tool that's used to create these different patterns. So all of these are called rifling profiles. They, you can have different sizes of a land or different sizes of a groove. You can have barrels that have lots of lands and grooves. You can have barrels that have very few lands and grooves. It just depends on how many you put in and the shape and that kind of thing. All right, so this picture shows you the, all the different parts of a cartridge that makes up a bullet and pretty much the process behind how a bullet gets fired. So we've looked at a fair amount of videos that showcase this, but now I'm going to show you on a still image. So your bullet, what we think of as a bullet, actually has two parts to it. There is the actual bullet, which is the part on top, and then you have this casing, also known as a cartridge. Inside of your cartridge, you have gunpowder, and then on the end part of your cartridge, you have this little section called a primer. And the primer contains just enough flammable material to create a spark if it's pierced or if it's hit. So that piercing or hit comes from a section of your gun called the firing pin. So the firing pin pushes against the primer that contains Again, flammable material that's going to create a spark. That spark travels up through this little hole and enters the bottom part of the cartridge where it's going to start burning away that gunpowder. And as that, but the gunpowder burns, it's going to start making gas. The gas expands and it starts pushing the bullet out and the bullet's going to move down the barrel of the gun. Okay, so now we care about how all of this relates to forensics. Well, a good amount of it is going to be class characteristics. Don't forget class means that it points to a group of individuals or a group of objects. 
Um, different gun manufacturers are going to use different rifling techniques, and these techniques are the ones that are going to give your bullet a bunch of different class characteristics. The most common that we will see would be the number of lands and grooves on a bullet, the width of the lands and grooves, the depth of the lands and grooves, something called pitch, which I'll explain later on, and twist. Twist just means what direction the lands and grooves are moving to. Are they moving to the right or are they moving to the left? By the way, all of this is important, so make sure you know all of that. There are some individual characteristics that we can gain from a bullet. So here I've detailed just a few of, you, of those for you. Um, and not just from bullets, but also from the gun as well, if we happen to have access to that. So a cross section of your gun barrel is going to show smaller, tiny grooves, also known as striations. So little lines already in the lands and grooves that already exist. So think of your lands and grooves as being a big object, and then you have all these smaller stripes on it. If I can draw that be something like this. So here's a land, okay, there's a groove, there's a groove, so let's call this a G, let's call that an L, let's call that a G. Oh, sorry. Inside of the lands and grooves themselves, you'll have even smaller little lines like that. Okay, that's what your striations are. Okay, so this amount of striations just depends on the kind of machine that was used to make this this particular gun or this particular barrel. Different machines are going to leave different types of stripes, different width of stripes, different sizes of stripes. So all of those things become individual characteristics. Okay, so again, these markings are created when the gun is rifled. So when we, we give it those depressions and those cuts on the inside, that's going to make the bullet twist. And no two gun barrels are going to have the exact same markings because it depends on the individual machine. Okay, so this is where you're going to get some unique impressions or unique stripes or, st or patterns on the bullet. And that can allow the bullet to be traced back to a particular firearm. So, what do I want you to know? Um, that you can have striations along your lands and grooves of a gun, and this comes from machine markings. You want to know that they're made when the gun is rifled and that no two guns have the exact same markings. And you want to know that these markings are unique and this allows the bullet to be traced back to a particular gun or firearm. Okay, so I hope that was clear. I know it gets a little weird to picture some of this in your head because the parts and pieces are so small. So here I'm going to switch to my laser. And this shows two separate bullets. Actually, before I do that, let's do this. So see how the, the image kind of changes? Like you can tell on the left, the image is actually darker. And then on the right, the image is slightly lighter. Well, that tells you that you're looking at two different bullets. So really and truly, let's do that. Okay, to kind of separate them. So you have one image on the left and another image on the right. Now, these tiny little lines that you're seeing here and here that the arrows are pointing to, those are going to be your striation marks. So when we line these two bullets up, you can tell that the lines connect. And that tells you that these bullets came from the same gun. Okay, they were fired from the same gun. Um, I'm going to take off that line that I drew in in blue just so that everyone can can see that it lines up. All right, so my app doesn't want to cooperate, so I can't take the line off, but we'll live. So as I've already mentioned, bullets aren't very big things, which means that all of these details that you can see on the bullet are also not going to be very big. As a matter of fact, your lands and your grooves are normally measured measured in thousands of an inch or in millimeters because they're so very small. So one of the ways that we can do these measurements, because you can't just pull out, you know, a regular size ruler and measure all these tiny little features, is to use an instrument that's called a micrometer. And that's what this whole instrument is. It's a micrometer. So you put your bullet or even your barrel between these tiny little, like, arms. This picture right here shows up close of those arms, so here and here. 
and it digitally reads that distance. So because this arm met, uh, sorry, <laughs> matches up right here with that section of your bullet and this one matches up right here with that section of your bullet, the machine is going to figure out what's the distance from this point to that point, which is a very small amount. Okay, And then down here I have just an example where we can look at the size of those lands and groove markings and determine if bullets came from the same kind of rifle. So here you can see that the land is, this is actually a groove, sorry, but you can see that the groove is a whole lot smaller than the groove over on B. So A's groove is smaller than the groove on B, which means that these two bullets did not come from the same firearm. Okay, we can also get some class characteristics from the cartridge of the gun, and normally that's something that we easily find at crime scenes, because most of these guns just pop the cartridges right out, and if the person committing the crime isn't thinking about it, they might leave those cartridges behind. So we can tell the manufacturer of that particular bullet based on the cartridge, we can tell the shape of the bullet, we can talk about caliber, like the size of the bullet, and the composition. What is it made of? Okay, so is it plastic, is it steel, is it brass, whatever, whatever. And yes, I do want you to know all of these things. So make sure all of this gets highlighted. Class characteristics. Right, just like we can tell class stuff, we can also tell some individual things from, car from cartridges, including firing pin impressions, breech face impressions, ejector marks, and extractor marks. And we'll talk about what these things are in a little bit, but please make sure that these things are known and highlighted. Okay, I just thought that this was a really good image of, you know, up close and personal image of the internal workings of a semi-automatic weapon. And you can kind of see where the magazine clips in, where the bullets sit. Sorry, I didn't mean to highlight there. Um, you know, the firing pin, the extractor, the barrel, including some of the, like, rifling marks that we've been talking about. So, just thought it was a good image. So the breech of a gun is pretty much just a chamber closest to the back of the gun where the bullet actually gets loaded. Now when a cartridge is fired, because you have this buildup of, of gases, it's going to force the bullet down the barrel, but it's going to trap the shell casing, also known as the cartridge, against the metal part of the breech. And again, that breech is just the chamber in which the bullet sits before it gets fired off. Well, that metal chamber is going to have some unique impressions or unique characteristics that get forced down onto the cartridge and it's going to leave behind a mark and we can use those marks to determine what type of gun that cartridge was fired from. Okay, so in terms of what I want you to know, I want you to know that the breech is going to leave impressions on the shell casing. Okay, so just those last two sentences or so. All right, so here are some examples of what breech markings can look like. You can just tell, it's just like little, literally little impressions, okay? Just how, how the bullet gets pushed up into that area. But these tend to be unique to guns. Different guns have different kinds. Okay, firing pin marks. So like I said before, for you to fire the cartridge, for you to actually push the bullet out, the primer must first be ignited, and that's done by the firing pin. So the firing pin is going to hit the very center ring of the cartridge, and this is normally going to leave an impression that's unique to the firing pin of a particular gun. So this little impression that you're seeing here in this image in the middle, that doesn't look the same for every gun. Different guns have leave different marks behind. Okay, so just make sure that you know that your firing pin is going to leave impressions that are distinct. Okay, so it leaves distinct or unique impressions. Okay, so we've all seen those movies or those shows where someone's, you know, shooting the gun and the cartridges are just flying out of the gun. Well, the parts that are responsible for pushing the cartridges out and making sure that there's space for the new bullet, they're called the extracting pin and the ejector. Sometimes they're called the extractor and the ejector, same thing. What they do is they push or throw out the casting or the cartridge from the bullet that's already been fired. They just make sure that it's clear of the chamber. And normally it just kind of falls on the floor. Um, 
but these two parts are capable of leaving marks on your shell casing or on your cartridge and they're going to be unique to those parts on different firearms. So here are just a couple of examples of, of what some of those marks could look like. Okay, They're always found on the side of those casings or those cartridges. They're normally pretty obvious. Now some of what we've been talking about really only works if that particular bullet came from a gun that has rifling. Shotguns do not have rifling. They have smooth barrels. No twists or turns or sections cut into the barrel whatsoever. So they don't leave any land or groove marks on the bullet. You can still do your identification for shotguns, however, by looking at the extractor, the ejector markings on the shell. They still do leave very obvious markings on the cartridge. It's important that you know this. So there are a few databases that the police and the FBI are going to use to keep records of uh, ballistics. Um, the first one is called the General Rifling Characteristics File. And pretty much it just is a running list of the land, groove, and twist characteristics of known weapons. Um, for class evidence, the FBI also has something called the FBI Drug Fire Program. And it's the development and deployment of automated firearms. And it's an identification system that's used to support, like, serial, gang, or drug-related shooting investigations. Okay? So, again, if, an, if a weapon has been involved in any related type of crime, like a serial crime, meaning serial killings, gang-related crime or violence, drug-related crime or violence, they keep running records of all of those guns that they collect so that it's easier to match some of this information up. There's also the IBIS, or Integrated Bullet Identification System, and that's used by the Bureau of Alcohol and T Tobacco and Firearms, or the ATF. Uh, in 1997, the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network, yeah, try saying that fast, also known as NIBIN, was created to develop a national imaging system. So every single bullet that gets imaged gets pushed straight into that database and everyone has access to it. What do you need to know on this slide? Pretty much everything. All of the acronyms and what they stand for. Um, yeah, who gets to use them, that kind of thing. So if you are a fan of Law & Order, because you see this on that show in particular a whole lot, then you probably have heard of gunshot residue before. Gunshot residue is also called GSR, and it's a chemical and particulate component of gases that's released when a gun is shot. So pretty much all of that gas that builds up it, it escapes the gun, just like the bullet escapes the gun. And not everything get, gets burnt up. Not all of the gunpowder is used up. So as the bullet comes rushing out of the gun, it normally comes rushing out alongside gases and little tiny bits of gunpowder and other chemicals. And as you can see in the picture, it kind of spreads. It doesn't just go in one direction. So this is gunshot residue, and you can get it on your hands, you can get it on your clothing. It pretty much clings to especially the person who shot the gun. You'll find it on their hand and their fingernails, their arms, their clothing, their face, their hair. But you'll also find it on anything that was close by. So you sometimes find it on furniture and walls. You might find it on your victim's skin and clothing, depending on how close the victim was to the actual gun. If it was hundreds of feet away, then of course, no, you won't find anything. But if they shot them at point-blank range right in front of them, then yes, you'll find some of that gunshot residue on your victim or anyone who happens to be standing by as well. Okay, and then we can take that residue and break it down into two sets. There's primer residue, and that's going to be stuff left behind from the actual exploding primer of the gun. And then there's also gunpowder residue, and that's left behind from when the gun was actually shot. It can be made up of gunpowder that you know has either burnt up or hasn't completely burnt up, smoke particles, and any particles that were not burnt. Okay, so we can do a chemical analysis or a chemical test for GSR, and it's called the grease test. And the grease test is used to, again, just to reveal GSR. Um, pretty much you take a piece of treated photographic paper, you press it over the area where you suspect that there might be GRS particles, and then you immerse or submerge that paper in a 
chemical reagent and the reagent is going to react with um, particles in the gunpowder, specifically nitrate particles in the gunpowder. Okay, You let it dry and once it's dried, the, you'll see a pattern of where that gunshot residue fell. Okay, um, There's also a lead residue test that we can also use for gunshot residue. Um, you know, if we suspect that there's gunshot residue on something. So you spray the area with a solution that's made up of sodium rhodizonate, rhodizonate, sorry. Um, and then you spray it again with a different solution on top, and it causes your lead particles to exhibit a pink color first, and then that pink color will change to like a bluish purplish color. But again, you'll see a pattern. You'll be able to see like where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated. Okay, so this image just shows some gunshot residue. You can see how it's more concentrated over here, and then it kind of spreads out. It's not as concentrated over there. And you can kind of see a purplish-brownish tinge to the shirt. While gunshot residue testing is useful, it's not always completely accurate because GSR can easily land on someone that was near the gun when it went off, but a lot of times that person has nothing to do with the actual crime at hand. The GSR can also be transferred by handling the gun after it was shot. So I shoot the gun, I put the gun down, and I walk away. Someone else comes and picks up the gun, and they're going to have remnants of gunshot residue on their hands, even though they're not involved in the crime whatsoever. Once you've done the chemical test, it does fade away fairly rapidly. You're not going to have access to that color change for a long time. Generally speaking, it only lasts about a couple of hours. The actual residue itself can dissipate, kind of like diffuse out very rapidly. After about two hours, you're not going to be able to find it unless it landed on an object. And it can easily be wiped or washed away as long as the person is taking lots and lots of care to really wash their hands and get under their fingernails and, and that kind of thing. Um, your primer residue does contain a very unique blend of metals. So that kind of makes it a little bit more accurate. And you can also tell whether a person has fired a gun recently because you're going to have a lot of certain kinds of chemicals. And then the longer it's been since that person has fired the gun, the less and less those chemicals show up in testing. Okay, another kind of test we can do is called a diphenylamine test. And I know on your sheet, this picture is kind of in the way. So please feel free to rewrite you know, whatever it is that the picture is coming up. So what you do for the diphenylamine test is you take a moist swab that's been, um, sorry, you, you take a moist swab and you, you pretty much just swab down or run it over the person's hands and arms and clothing, but it has to be treated with diphenylamine. And what it does is diphenylamine is going to indicate wherever you have metals present. And because bullets do have a fair amount of metal parts and pieces, then it's a way of, of generating or determining whether someone has recently been in contact with, with the metal from gunshots or gunshot residue. Um, this one is very, very easy to have po false positive, sorry, so it pretty much will test positive in the presence of tobacco or certain kinds of cosmetics or even urine. So we use it kind of as, should we investigate this further? We don't use it to completely determine whether or not someone's been in the presence of a fired gun. Okay, one of the things that's very, very helpful for a forensic scientist when it comes to ballistics and firearms is to do a crime scene reconstruction. And when doing a crime scene reconstruction, there's a lot of information we can gather. Things like the trajectory or the path that the bullet took, um, the shooting distance from the person firing the shot to the person or the object getting hit, the position and location of the victim, the position and location of the offender, the sequence of shots, the direction of shots, the possibility that the wound could have been self-inflicted. So in other words, you know, someone's attempting to commit suicide. And then we can also figure out um, if the use of a particular weapon could be linked to several different cases depending on what that reconstruction shows us. Okay, I know you can't see this very well, but this just shows laser trajectory, which is a way that we can determine not just the position of the shooter, but the, the distance away from the object, the height at which the shooter was standing when the gun went off. 
um, based on the path of that bullet. You will learn how to do this both with lasers and with something called string trajectory or string technique um, when I get back. So hopefully this wasn't too painful and you could get through it. If you didn't finish it all the way, then we'll finish it up in class or if we run out of time, you know, we'll figure it out once I get back. Bye guys.